Today, I think we have a very interesting session, the last one, uh, which is probably what most of you are interested in. How do I take a product or services, uh, as the earlier speaker said, whether it's tangible or intangible? How do you take it to the market? How do you find the global markets, especially, uh, for your products? So we have uh, uh, a great panel here this afternoon. We have Ashok. Yeah. We have Ashok here. Ashok Kartam, he is uh, actually a serial entrepreneur. Uh, he is the CEO of MIs, and I'm sure you all guessed what MIs is. Uh, something to do with mobile. So I will let uh, uh, Ashok uh, kind of give a, a brief uh, uh, introduction of himself, and then we'll have Alfred Goldberg. A native uh, of Tampa and another entrepreneur here, and uh, I'll let him do the job of introduction. And then last, we have uh, Shankar, uh, who you all heard in the morning. And uh, <laughs> so Ashok, uh, can you just give a quick uh, bio or a brief about your background? Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Ashok Khatam. I'm the founder and CEO of MICE. As uh, Mahesh was saying, MICE stands for Mobilize and Monetize, and it's short form to remember. And before this, I had a company called 4CS, where we were one of the leaders in warranty and service lifecycle management, which was acquired about a couple of years ago by PTC. So I moved to Tampa just a little bit over a year ago, and uh, having, uh, having a lot of fun building this company. Look forward to along with the panel here, share a little bit more about how these technologies are impacting all of us and also where the opportunities are. And I'm uh, Alfred Goldberg, president of the Americas for Absolute Mobile Solutions. We are a 14-year-old digital marketing agency. We are present in over a dozen countries. Uh, as was mentioned, I am a third-generation campaignian. And I'm very active in the community from sitting on the board of governors of Tampa Bay Wave I'm also a charter member of TAI, something I find very rewarding, and I encourage you all to pursue uh, charter membership if it's uh, within your, your, your budget. And I'm looking forward to this panel. Okay, um, let me start with uh, mobile being the topic. Uh, two of the panelists uh, uh, obviously have uh, experience in the mobile space as well as in the digital marketing space. When you look at mobile today, you have about 3.2 million subscribers worldwide. And when you look at the connections, that includes your broadband connections on the on mobile networks and M2M, you have about 6.8 billion connections worldwide and it's expected to be about 15 billion connections uh, in just a matter of three years. So that's one part of the, uh, the equation that's uh, uh, staring at us. And the second one, uh, is, I think, very valid in terms of people who are looking for opportunities and who are looking for areas where they can monetize. Voice data and text messaging revenue are hitting the third wave as uh, Chetan Sharma, who is a good friend of mine, who runs a consulting out of Seattle, uh, talks about, and basically the revenues are flattening out. The voice is actually declining worldwide. Um, barring some exceptions in Africa and in Asia. And text messaging, as we all know, is um, having a hard time uh, with OTT players uh, really uh, selling the application-based messaging, whether it is the IM, uh, whether it's a WhatsApp, uh, you name it. There are plenty of applications worldwide uh, which people can use, which is acting as a substitute, which is basically driving those text messages revenue down, as well as uh, uh, the, the volume on the operator's network going down. The third one, data, I think has been a phenomenal story since 2007, <coughs> since iPhone got introduced uh, in the US. I think the data market has seen explosive growth here. And I think it will continue depending on the cycle, uh, evolution cycle of the networks worldwide in terms of whether people are deploying the HSPA network, the 4G LTE network, and then people are talking about 5G now. But when you look at this, the fourth wave that people are talking about, which is taking the mobility and the telecom industry, which has got 1.5 trillion market, 
and it's going to be tripling in a matter of three years because of what I call the proliferation of these applications that are related to what I call cloud-based applications. You have the big data, uh, which has been talked about a lot uh, recently, and uh, also you have what I call content uh, that's being put out there uh, that are driving the use of these applications, which is going to be uh, driving the fourth wave. Now, with that, let me turn to the panelists here in terms of sharing what their view on three topics here, and then we'll get to the, the one that uh, I would like Shankar and then Ashok as well as Alfred to talk about how best uh, you can market the services and what are some of the things that you should be watching, watching out for and what are the things that are do's and don'ts. Uh, so the first one is, uh, what is the next big thing that people should expect? Um, Ashok, let me start with you in terms of the applications uh, space. Sure. Before getting into the next big thing, I want to also a little bit set the context. If you look at these three technologies, mobile, cloud, and big data, we are all impacted almost every day. Probably every hour, we all carry our mobile phones or mobile devices with us, and everything you do there is stored in the cloud. Whether it's your photos, your music, your email, everything is stored there. Without it, you cannot access or do anything with it. And then if you look at the big data, again, are all these transactions happening? It's not the value is not in the individual transactions. It's the meaning you get out of those combination of those transactions. So you get recommendations for who could be your next Facebook friend, who could you be connecting to LinkedIn, or music recommendations. Any of those are based on how this big data is utilized so they can give you something that's relevant and value to you. So if we look at all the technologies then, we are already impacted a lot every day in our lives with it. So when I look at the next thing, again, all these technologies, one thing that stays constant is, it's about, again, people. People want to be wherever they are. They want to be able to accomplish what's in their interest, it is they are enjoying, it's an entertainment, or you are trying to do a job. So again, look at it is, what are the next thing you can take it with them? Again, technology need to follow the people, that's where either you take cars, people having the independence to go wherever they are, whether it's mobile phones, or it's the wearable technology that's coming, so the technology will be along with the people to go with it. And then the cloud again says, is it doesn't matter where things are, you don't want to know where to connect. Before, maybe you were only connecting to your company server. Right? Now, the data is everywhere on the backend side of it. Again, it goes is what are the things people trying to access? It's about the API, it's about the cloud that's happening to do it. And then if you take the big data, again, the whole value is how do you personalize it? How do you make sure it's very relevant to them? The people's attention is very sharp. Most of the marketing is, I kind of claim is, the advertising, email campaigns, a lot of these are there. What's going to happen is it's going to be able to deliver relevant experiences for the people when they need it. So if you combine those three things that will stay constant, people want technology where they are, people want to be able to access wherever things are that, that suits them, and be able to get more relevant value out of it. Again, you can continue to go on that spectrum and then look at what would be the next thing. So again, we think the devices will get to be everywhere. Mobile definition is changing. You talked about the waves. What I kind of see is the mobile definition now is, it's not just about smartphones. Your car is smart, your appliance is smart, your TV is smart. So those are uh, mobile devices. So that will continue to happen. You can look at where can you add that smartness. Right? And then what is the data you can provide it easily and the value. And since I did it, I will let others speak and then we can come back to what are some of the specifics associated with let me ask the question, Alfred, uh, differently uh, to you given your marketing background. Big data, as we see it, obviously, uh, it's in the mining of the data. And obviously, there are concerns about the security, the privacy issue, which has been talked a lot about given the, the Google context. And so, in, in, with all these challenges that are there from the privacy sector, uh, your mobile security in terms of the information that you have and how secure it is and how it's going to be used by different marketing agencies and different companies that access this big data. So in this, uh, what I call environment that we have, 
what is the best way that you can use this to the advantage of digital marketing? So uh, those are very, very good questions. And depending on what country you're in, there's completely different standards and acceptable practices as to the use of personal information. A lot of big data is actually anonymous. It's just scrubbed of who are those particular people. It just focuses on traits. That data can be used pretty freely because it's not tied to a specific person. But when you're trying to provide customizable value to a single entity, you need personal information. Uh, in the United States, I think many other countries, that's just going to have to follow an opt-in network because if you don't want your private information as part of that, then you just won't receive the value. And younger generations are showing more and more um, tolerance of their data being shared than older generations. So it's really going to be a time issue. Uh, there's a lot of uh, you know scary science fiction views that you know big government's going to know everything about you, and and you know maybe that'll be true someday. But by the time that happens, maybe no one's really going to care. But right now, you just have to stay on top of the law. Don't take information that you don't absolutely need to provide the value, and be careful how you store that data. Make sure it's secure. A lot of industries, like the medical industry, has HIPAA uh, compliance regulations. You should take a look at the industries that are doing that and try and apply as much of those to your industry, whether it's required or not, just so you have that extra level of security. Just to follow up to that, uh, I read somewhere that 70% uh, of the users that you see here on mobile, you mentioned about the younger crowd who share their privacy information more often than the the, the generation, not my generation. 70% uh, of people when they use, in the normal course of day, they are sharing data and they are actually permitting the application owners or the data owners to use that data. So there is actually an explicit consent by the user. So where does the opt-in question come in when you have already given an explicit consent? So I was just coming here, I put the, the Google, for directions, and it basically said, do you want to allow your location data uh, to be a share? So you obviously say yes, and you have given the explicit consent. So what are the things that we need to be cognizant of as application providers or otherwise, or even marketing agencies to be aware of with these kind of what I call openness that's there? You have to be clear what the consent is for. You can't, for example, ask for someone's email address to mail them a catalog and then use that for a million other purposes, or even worse, sell that information. Uh, you've all seen consent where a real small one will say, click here for our terms of use, and I guarantee you no one here has probably read the terms of use. It's, it's just when you ask for that consent, you can't ask for consent for one thing and then use it for another purpose. Shankar, let me turn uh, to you on the cloud side. Um, about three years ago, there was about two billion terabytes of data uh, that's created and uh, uh, it's in the cloud in terms of various applications and data that you see. And in a matter of three years, pundits say that it's going to quadruple, right? Now, obviously, it creates opportunities both on the, the cloud side in terms of utilizing this data and creating applications and services around that, that's one. Second, on the hardware side, obviously with the LT and the broadband networks that are being de deployed, the, having the data and the applications in the cloud makes sense because you can access it and the networks allow for access of that data, whether it's photo, multimedia, uh, even what I call the, the heavy big data itself or the big content can be delivered very easily on these high-speed networks. So what are the opportunities that you see on the hardware side as well as on the software side? So first of all, uh, uh, people should be under the illusion that networks can carry all the data. I, I mean, I know you come from a networks business, but frankly, uh, I have customers who physically have to bring their data via ship because, you know, that's the fastest way to get the data into the data center. That's how big the data is. Um, so, so there's always something called Tandell's law. And so the network can get faster and faster, but there will always be bandwidth limitations. It's like there's always processor limitations or storage limitations. So having said that, um, 
the fundamental thing that's happening is that irrespective of where this is headed, the data is going to be in a data center somewhere. But the use of this data is going to be on the edge on some sort of device. So what's happening is the innovation is coming at all ends of the spectrum. You know, the way you store the data, the way you deliver and encode and decode the data, the way you interpret the data. There's innovation in every piece of that uh, data cycle. And, and I think this is going to be like a golden age. You know, when I grew up, all the data was just numbers and text. And, we still grew up. and now we have, uh, it, you know, we have n dimensions of data. You know, before data was just either it was text or it was um, a number or it was special character. There was no kind of concept of an audio, or video, or photo, or location, latitude, longitude, uh, you know, genes, sequences, cells. All of these are different data types. And, and uh, the way you encode, decode, encrypt, decrypt um, data, and the way you deliver it, you know, out of the cloud into services, is going to be fantastic. Um, so that's kind of the first thing. The second thing is on the hardware side. You know, um, I already showed sort of a video in, in the morning about you know how uh, computing is coming um, uh, to the mobile space. Um, but the most interesting thing that that uh, I think is happening is the screen, you know, um, at the end of the day, the screens are too small. And so I think that's going to be like, uh, on the hardware side, some really interesting innovation with the types of screens. Uh, so, you know, wouldn't it be cool to sort of pull out a, a, a device and then sort of looking at this tiny screen and you just kind of, open, it just opens up in front of you. Uh, and now, it doesn't have to physically open up in front of you, it could be just in your brain that you're seeing it. And I think those uh, kind of innovations will happen in hardware um, instead of in software. So all these wearables and Google Glass and you know, uh, different types of new materials that are coming out um, are, are going to try and create this fascinating um, proliferation of devices. But the, the money making, by this, you know, money making, I think, is, you know, we're all entrepreneurs here. People kind of think about all the you know kind of ways you make money on the device, but actually, there's a lot of money to be made in the cloud, in the data center, doing the interpretation, working the services, uh, and, and so on. Yeah, I think Apple has proved us wrong, but there's a lot, not, lot of money to be made on the hardware, <laughs> um, so there is an exception there. But uh, um, I, I think speaking of wearables, speaking of different types of devices, computing devices that you can come in. And the fact that the money to be made is in the software, not on the hardware, I'm going to go by what you said. There's a big, what I call, battle that's been uh, fought in the, at least in the mobility space between the iPhone and the iOS, and you have the Android. Mm -hmm. And then there is a hope uh, that HTML5 is going to basically solve all the issues around the world for the software developers. Yeah. So you build it once and run it anywhere is a concept that's been talked about and we've all heard it in the past 10 years ago. There was the JVME. Before that, another 10 years before that was the WAP and uh, WML. I don't know how many of you remember that if you're coming from application side of it. So let me start with uh, Alf on the HTML5. What do you think uh, the opportunities are? Should app developers start looking at that or not worry about it and continue on the Android and the uh, iOS bandwagon. You know, I had this uh, discussion on a panel about two years ago and it almost turned into a fist fight. So you guys, <laughs> you really... Yeah, we'd really have a okay. Um, because I said that because of the prevalence of web developers, the problems of fragmentation across devices, uh, and that's actually getting worse, not better. Uh, HTML5 was the only long-term viable solution to that problem. Uh, the rest of the panel were native development shops and they, they wanted to string me up. Uh, what I didn't get a chance to say is we do a lot of native development. HTML5 is not going to get rid of native development. It's a tool, it has its uses, it also has its limitations. And just like you talked about the, the rule where there's always going to be bandwidth problems, is always going to be performance problems with a platform like HTML, uh, HTML5, which is a, a markup language. 
Um, you definitely should be paying attention to it. Uh, a few years back, we used to ask the question, well, can we do this with HTML5? Nowadays, we say, why shouldn't we do this with HTML5? And if there's a good reason, then we go native. But we start looking at HTML5 first, just because of its cost effectiveness, as well as um, its uh, cross-platform uh, capabilities. Ashokra, what's your view? Whether you're into Android, you're into um, iPhone or iOS-based applications. Sure. First thing, borrowing from that Bill Clinton slogan, in the technology, the main thing is, it is the experience. That's what is most important. How, does your, how do your customers feel about what you are delivering? So I think the technology vision is not as critical. If we take as a company, we are doing iOS and Android development natively, mainly because we think we can deliver a better customer experience. We are doing HTML5 development because we do think there are users that are out there that are still using the laptops and the computers and the Windows phones. So we need to support them so we deliver HTML5. So I think that decision needs to be based on what is the application you are trying to provide, what is that the customers will benefit. In that scenario, how do you deliver the best customer experience? So again, the technology side, other, I think, uh, I think Steve Jobs or a lot of other people said two years. I think the best technology is the technology that disappears. Right? It focuses on the customer experience. So I think we will select the tools based on how do we make that happen. Okay. Um, we can talk about the, the technology and the emerging what I call, uh, opportunity areas, but uh, let me switch here. Uh, you have two sides of the world as an entrepreneur and as a marketer of your services and products. You have the Western world, which seems to have uh, an endless supply of money. And then you have a large population that probably want to have the services, but don't want to pay at the Western world. So how do you look at the Western world and the old world and create markets for your services? And are there obviously product strategies that you can use? different channel, sales channel strategies that you can use. Certainly pricing will play a big role uh, in, in that as well. So what's your view, and Shankar, let me start with you on that. Yeah, so uh, we have a very interesting, uh, um, how many of you have been to an eye cafe in China? So in China there are, every city has, you know, multiple eye cafes. And every eye cafe has lots and lots of PCs there. And that's where the kids go for computer gaming and social networking, and so on. And they're full, they're jacked, it's like a bar. And so uh, when we looked at this you know, problem of how do we get our, our GPUs to market for gaming, we actually uh, basically targeted eye cafes. And today we dominate that area. Uh, and people are amazed how much computer gaming goes on in China. And you know, each, each uh, transaction, I guess, is a small amount, but they're all sharing the PC. And we felt we don't discount our prices. Um, you know, a GPU costs the same in, in fries or in, in, you know, in China, but it's the way it's used that, that's important. And even in our enterprise business, we basically, you, you have to use appropriate distribution channels to market. In today's world, pri you know, doing arbitrage pricing, doing pricing, differential pricing for the same product is a recipe for disaster. I guarantee to you, your best customer, you know, I have like, for example, GE as my customer. That guy knows exactly how much we're selling it in Shanghai. So you can't arbitrage it. And you also, I think, a, a developing an emerging market customer doesn't want an inferior experience. You know, they want actually a superior experience. So the art of this is to find the right application partners, content partners, distribution channels, and other ecosystem to do it. Um, and we, 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 you know, today, I think today we introduced something called a Tegra Note which is a little tablet with a reference design. And that's squarely targeted at the China market. And people, uh, we've shown people how you can uh, take a seven inch tablet, market it high quality for about a, the equivalent of $129 in R&Ds. You know, and including the retail channel making money on this. So that's the way we get to it. So on the product side, obviously you can, uh, I agree with you that the same product no, and I, I tell you, when I, when I first joined NVIDIA, we actually created a China, you know, uh, 
somebody came up with a great idea, let's have a China specific product. And we made it and we actually wrote off about $29 million worth of the damn product, you know, right? So uh, I, I, I'm speaking, I learned from fa some failures as well. Uh, yeah, I, I, no, I, I, I agree and disagree to some extent. Obviously, the like, products can be designed to define uh, different markets. Uh, I, I think this was a big debate last week about an Apple iPhone, right? Uh, whether the 5C that got introduced is it for the emerging market, and time will tell. Um, but I think all the reports that I've seen that it's neither here nor there. So, so, so that's a, a, a debate for another day. But uh, let me shift uh, the focus to uh, Alf on the Alfred. I'm sorry, on the channels. Do you use the channels differently when you have to deal with the mass market, uh, which is uh, like China or India or Africa versus European market or the North American? Market? We, we tend to focus on the mass market. We very much believe in the long tail. Most apps are free. I think it's like 64% of apps are free. If your objective is to make a lot of money off just the development of a mobile application, it's, it's, it's extremely difficult uh, for some of the things that uh, were mentioned earlier to take it and then bring it into an emerging market and make the same premium. Uh, by focusing on different goals like reaching a mass market, engaging a particular say in the case of mobile marketing, a particular brand's audience, free is fine. You're making the money from those connections, not from the sell of the app. Uh, so whether it's in the US, uh, the developer world, or the development world, we do tend to focus on a mass market channel. Uh, next month I'll be in Brazil. That's the next destination that we're focusing on. A lot of people are not aware of Brazil has just surpassed India as the fifth largest smartphone market in the world. Um, some of the things that are happening in Brazil are happening lightning fast, and you, you need to get in there quickly. If you went in there with a premium product approach, you're not going to get enough market penetration to really make it worth your while. So we definitely focus on mass market, whether it's in developed or undeveloped, when we're dealing with, with a value stream based off that engagement. If it's per uh, application for a particular enterprise, then it's more direct channel um, marketing because you're you're actually making your money off, you know, a smaller set of users with a particular need. So depends if we're looking for mobile marketing, driving engagement, driving sales, or if we're looking to provide a particular value through the solution, which which approach we take. And uh, I will state that very few of our enterprise or you know direct user value apps. Um, have been successful in the developing world. Most of them are in Western Europe, Asia, Australia, Israel, or North America. Uh, it tends to be the, the free uh, mass market solutions that we tend to do better with in, in Latin America, which is actually my focus. Very quickly, one last question on this, teeing off on the enterprises. For small companies or startup companies, uh, reaching out to enterprises as a B2B, uh, is a, a, a bit of a challenge using direct sales. So what are the kinds of things uh, that we should be looking at as small companies or entrepreneurs for a B2B type of product? I think, again, talking about the first two questions, previous two questions too, actually, that will lead to the answer for that. For, as we all know, technology is actually is a leveling field. Right? Because of the technology now across the world, Billions of people are able to access things that they were never able to access. And also, technology, one of the trends, especially with the information technology, is trend is it trends towards zero. Right? Now, the long distance is free for all of us in a way, even in India through IP, IP to do it. The apps are almost free. Most of the apps that are there are free. All the information that's available on the internet is free. So, we do think what technology has done is brought a lot more people into the market. And when you talk about the B2B, again, what we, we say is, it's not the B2C market where a lot of uh, companies, especially in the technology, you make money. It's how you are enabling other businesses to reach those customers. Right? So as a company, what we're saying is, these customers, it's not like, take pizza, for example. You, it's not the access to order pizza is always going to be free. 
access to mall is going to be free. It's how you enable that customer to connect to that company so they can order the pizza a lot easier than before, so the pizza company is going to pay for it. Right? I mean, you can apply that to any other company in a way. So when you look at the, then our own marketing to the businesses, again, we say is how you position to say how you are enabling them to do their business uh, easier is how we look at it. So part of what we have done, again, I want to use an example, is we do have a, a business where we said it's about smarter customer engagement, where we, we will connect these mobile and social consumers to companies and enable companies to engage better with them. But to be able to do that, we had to build the consumer base to say, we do have consumers that we can connect to you, right? And then the market to the businesses to say where the technology is going, how we can educate to them. Again, if you look at all the technology marketing, it's about content marketing, how you become a trusted advisor to them, that you are able to offer them something valuable as an advisor, that's what companies are looking for. And again, personally, I believe, either in the consumer market, as well as in the B2 market, most of the time, advertising is dead. We don't watch advertising. We always try to avoid it, right? We, if we keep sending emails, most of the time we delete them or we even put a filter to automatically delete them. So the best way to reach companies is, again, find out what is that you have as a value and try to offer that value to the companies. Then companies are willing to listen to you and then you can kind of uh, present it that way. I think it's the same in B2C or B2B and that's where I think we are heading. Okay. Let me open the floor for questions uh, uh, if you have any for the time. We have uh, five minutes. Uh, no? Okay, we're almost on the phone. So, what's your uh, what's the new technology coming out for the laser projectors that will be in tomorrow? How does that affect what you guys are doing in gaming? Laser projectors. Laser video projectors that are small and will be enhanced. Yeah, I haven't seen one. Actually, I keep wishing that the whole notion of Connecting, you know, you walk into a conference room and whatever device you have should just automatically connect with the projector. And unfortunately, I think we're a long way away from it. I, I think, well, yeah, but it's a band. It just, it, it just sucks. <laughs> somebody has to fix that problem. So you still connect the cable. It, it just, you know, whichever way you can. Well, Apple TV is the way yeah. <laughs> Can I, can I just, I want to I actually share some advice about uh, selling in the enterprise. Uh, I, I've been doing this for 30 years, and um, you know, we all like to close business with enterprises. And, um, when, when you're a small entrepreneur, you know, small company, uh, the key thing is, you know, any large company, you know, we can argue about what size, once this is large, the size of the company is big, it's a long haul. It's going to cost you a lot of money. It doesn't matter in terms of time. And so on. And so you've got to be the one thing I always because we can talk, I want to talk about different techniques and you know where is more appropriate. But the one rule which is there for every enterprise engagement, every B2B engagement, is you've got to make sure you're doing one of the three things have to be every year for the answer, three things, yes. First of all, are you talking to a person who actually can make a decision? Number two, do they actually have the money? And number three, is this the right time? Mm -hmm. and, and I see so many times, whether it's a phone conversation, a meeting people go to, you know, and I see people constantly stumbling. They're not talking to decision maker. The, the person doesn't have the money. Or they do have money, but right now is not the time. And I say, don't waste your time. You know, and every entrepreneur, every time you have a conversation with any customer, just keep that in mind. I'm assuming you've done the basic, you know, yes, you've got to, Problem for which you have a solution, you know. But D, dollar, and T. Decision maker, money, and time. Oh, right. If you follow that, you know, you, you, you'll make money. No, I, I think, thank you. Uh, I mean, I lived in day in, day out, selling to operators and selling to large enterprises. Um, I, I think with that remark from Shankar, I think we'll close. I think uh, you, it's absolutely from a selling point of view the key decision maker hitting that. Otherwise, you will be spinning lots of cycles. And I don't think the small companies uh, have the time or the money uh, or can't afford it actually in the marketplace. So with that, let me end the session and thank you. Uh,
Uh, thank you all.